Here's the idea of dovetailing, and the way we'll describe it is in the solution to this A complement. We want to come up with a method to determine whether to determine whether a Turing machine accepts something. So we make all the strings in order, in size, etc. And we start running the Turing machine on these strings. Now here's a way that doesn't work. It's not okay to run the Turing machine on this string and wait to see what the answer is. Because you might not ever get an answer. We're trying to find out whether the Turing machine stops and accepts one of these strings. You can't just run it on this string, say wait for the answer yes or no, and then go on to the next string. So we have to kind of dovetail through. Let's run this for one step, and then move on to this guy. And then let's run this for one more step, and run this for one step. Okay, and now let's have the machine start on this one, run this for one step, run this for one more, and run this for one more. And now we'll have the machine start in the fourth string. Run this for one step, run this for another step, run this for another step, and run this for another step. It's keeping track of four different computations. It's got an infinite tape. It can keep track of these computations as much as it wants. At any given time, it's running an arbitrary number of computations, all at different points in the tape, doing one more step on each one every single time it moves on. So it's a lot of work. It's got to go to this area, move one more step, this area, move one more step. And that way, it hits every single string's computation as far as you want in a finite amount of time. So if it's the tenth string that gets accepted on the 70th spot, I can calculate exactly how many steps it'll take my machine to find that. Okay? It'll have to go down 70 strings below and finally get that string over here done 70 steps worth. Does that make sense, Tony? Yeah. I get it about 90%. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? Maybe there's more clarification I can do on this? The one thing I'm not sure getting is you still can only, a given cycle can only be on one string at a time, right? They're not really running in parallel. So it just, it either it goes. Yes, the yes, the machine is always focusing on one string at a time. So if you've gone 10,000 times, your first one wouldn't have actually gotten 10,000 cycles on it, would it? If you've done 10,000, if you started 10,000 strings, yeah. let's say we're up to the 10,000th string. Right? Every 10, strings, I'm sorry, yeah, it, just, it would be more than 10,000 cycles. I, 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 I was confusing two things. The, yeah, it's like every, time, every string you add represents another cycle on each of those. Every string you add represents doing one more cycle or one more step of the computation on each one of the ones above you. This trick is useful if you want to prove that you're going to halt on one or more, even though on some of those you may never halt. It's a way of getting the ones, in which you halt. The ones in which you halt, even though there may be others that you don't halt. So you don't get stuck on the infinite row. You know what it's exactly like, if you remember, and this might not be useful for any of you, but... Um, <laughs> I'll tell you anyway. <laughs> At some point, somebody proved to you that rational numbers had the same cardinality as integers. And they represented rational numbers by pairs of numbers, you know, A over B. And that every entry in this big table, in this big infinite table, is a rational number. And to show you that it's the same cardinality as the integers, I have to show you a way of getting through it in an organized, listable way. And here's the wrong way to do that. OK, just number them this way. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then what's this number? Well, I went infinity, so I can't continue. But that's just the bad way to do it. The right way to do this is what? Zigzag, Zigzag right. So I'm going to call this the serpentine method. No more dovetailing. Serpentine, 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 serpentine. You zigzag your way through it, keeping in some sense, the size or the sum of the two pairs constant. These are all the ones with sum 1. These are all the ones with sum 3, all the ones with sum 4, all the ones with sum 5, where the sum of the pairs equals 5. So you start you know, 1 over 1, and then 1 over 2, and then 2 over 1, sums of 2, sums of 3, sums of 4, sums of 5. And that way, I'm ordering them in a nice order. It's kind of what's going on here a little bit in the computation. It's a similar idea.
If this helps, fine. And if it doesn't help, forget it. I mean, it reminds me of this. And I think it reminds most people of this, yeah. Um, can you explain again why the dovetailing doesn't work in the case that we're looking at Turing machines that accept only one string? Yes. So let's say we do this dovetailing and we're trying to recognize Turing machines that accept just one string. We don't know which one, but they're going to accept one. So we're running it on all these strings simultaneously. And we're trying to find Turing machines that accept one string. Well, let's say you go through here and one of these computations stops and says, I accept. Do you know that your Turing machine accepts only one string? Yeah. At least one string. You don't know it accepts only one string. Okay. We'd have to keep going right. forever and hope we get no other. And we can't do that. Okay. But even the opposite, even trying to get a machine that doesn't accept one string, we get trouble. Because what if we run it on all these things simultaneously and none of them ever get accepted? We just don't know if we haven't hit the string yet. Right, we don't know if we haven't hit the string yet. If I changed it, Turing machines that accept at least one, at least one string or at most one string, then I could recognize half of that. Okay. Because I could run this until sooner or later I get something more than one string. And if, and if that was going to happen, I would get it. It's saying exactly one that actually makes the two ends hard. Does that make sense, Sharon? OK. Uh, OK, so here's my plan. I'm going to do two more things today. Uh, the most interesting, exciting thing I'm going to do on Sunday. We're going to have a lecture on Sunday. Sunday, I'm going to do this decidability thing from scratch. I'm going to prove to you the first undecidable problem is really undecidable. And from there come all the reductions to these other problems that we've already talked about a little bit, where we don't have to do the proof from scratch. But that first proof, I want you guys fresh and not cloudy and, and thinking clearly. So we'll do that Sunday. Uh, what I want to finish with today is one more idea of uh, thinking about a Turing machine, and then one big example that we'll do together. So we'll finish off with some, uh, some help on this big example, and before that, a little bit of an abstraction. And the abstraction is Turing machines as enumerators. The whole course so far, we think of machines as acceptors. They either accept the strings you give them, or they reject them. For Turing machines, they might loop forever. But a Turing machine is kind of a powerful tool. And you could think of it as an outputter, just like finite state machines and context for grammars can have output. You could think of them as having output also. We usually don't talk about it in this class, but you could do that. There's a third way to think of Turing machines, and that's this way, as an enumerator. And all this means, it's not a fancy, really complicated idea. All it means is that you write a Turing machine, and all it's going to do is kind of act like a grammar. It's going to generate the strings successively on its tape, all the strings that it would normally accept. Instead of waiting for input, it's got no input. You just write the program, and it generates the strings out on the tape. Everyone understand what this machine does? So a different kind of Turing machine program. It's like you're writing programs and you got no input statements. I just tell you what I want you to compute, and you spit them out one at a time. And sooner or later, if I waited long enough, I'd see them all. All right, questions about that? Would it do it by just counting up lexicographically and printing out the exact? Well, that's a very good question. And if you watch the board this afternoon, I will answer it. <laughs> it's a very good question. What we're going to do right now is relate Turing machine enumerators to, uh, to Turing machine acceptors. What's the relationship between them? All right, so if a language is recursively enumerable, then there is a Turing machine enumerator. And if there's an enumerator, then the language is recursively enumerable. Hence the word enumerate. Now we're going to prove this in just a very logical way, not too tedious mathematically at all, just completely by thinking about the meanings of these different kinds of machines. Again, let's review what an enumerator is. It's a Turing machine that doesn't take any input and spits out one by one by one on its tape with, say, a special pound sign in between each string all the strings that it's supposed to uh, represent. Recursively enumerable.